right, well, thank you, Dr. Baker, for that enlightening talk, I suppose. Um, is there any questions anyone would like to kick off with, or be willing to reflect on those? Um, I would have a question to maybe start, and it's, it's not on, well, it, it stems from corporation tax, and it's that, well, I think we can discount corporation tax as a magic bullet approach for Northern Ireland. But uh, you describe Northern Ireland as being at an economic impasse. Is the challenge really to change the rhetoric, rhetoric at Stormont and change this whole the corporation tax? And is the answer more diverse and better redistribution? Because the competencies that Stormont have is obviously fairly limited. So what can Stormont do, if anything? Um, I think try and wrestle some autonomy over, over company law. I think that's important. I think definitely trying to catalyze science parks, prioritizing certain sectors, right? And prioritize certain sectors. What what is a product that is in global demand at the moment and the whole of Ireland is really good at, right? Dairy. Dairy. And you know, but to, to upgrade upgrade the sector and to do it in an ecologically sustainable fashion. It needs some degree of investment. Um, green and renewable technologies, you know, there's enormous potential to become to become a leader in that. There's also uh, the opportunity to kind of, again, to play around with company law, to have a look at the financial system and work out how you can encourage local banks, creditors, to invest in those kind of longer term opportunities which are currently being started for investment by at least coming in and trying to underwrite some of that risk locally. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean funding it through state money. It just means taking on some of the risk so as to make it more attractive for private investors to go in that direction. So a shift to something more like a German model? Is this this kind of coordinated market economy? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, almost but not quite. Um, and yeah, oh, almost but not, yeah, something along those lines. but. You've got to think. I think you've got to think out of the box. Get Northern Ireland to put its own unique stamp on it. I think there's an opportunity to break with this. I don't think. I don't think it's going to help Northern Ireland, given the level of social polarisation, which isn't just about income. We know there's another kind of form of social polarisation as a kind of post-conflict or conflict transformational society going on as well. And this one's going to go bad unless you deal with it. And that, that, that's my fear. Um, can, I, can I tell you why I object to corporation tax in a little more detail? Okay. <coughs> Firstly, it's legally complex, and I'm convinced that it'll end up being challenged, it'll get wrapped up in the EU court system for years, and that'll create all kinds of uncertainty, and that'll be bad for the Northern Irish economy. Secondly, I don't actually understand the argument. I think the argument's rubbish. Um, the argument is that you create a level playing field with the Republic. This is nonsense. You can't create a level playing field with the Republic simply by devolving corporation tax. Because the Republic has this whole panoply of tax measures, tax breaks and tax credits, which means it basically some corporations in the South get away, global investors get away with, without paying any tax. Northern Ireland can't replicate that without wholly ceding from the UK for tax purposes. And then you've got the dangers of the Treasury getting uh, rather irate about it and introducing cross-transfer pricing rules, which would actually then make it more expensive to trade with the rest of the UK from Northern Ireland, a lot less expensive. But just, anyway, none, none of that's going to happen, so it's hypothetical, but just playing with corporation tax alone, it's impossible to create a level playing field. What, what you're really saying is we're going to try and copy our bigger neighbour, but we can only really be a pair limitation of them. So why would you want to do it? You've got to go out on your own and carve out your own niche. Don't try and copy the Republic. The Republic has access to the Euro as the world's largest single market without exchange rate risk. Northern Ireland without exchange rate risk has access to the U UK market and that's it. So they're entirely different propositions. Better looking for an alternative. Um, as I've indicated, the third thing is as I've indicated, the numbers on this look ridiculous to me. The, the, the Oxford Economics Group. I mean I just don't see the 580,000 extra top jobs 
And then you, when you dig into it, you see that all of this depends on a 70% increase in so-called STEM professionals. I mean, I just think that this is just for the birds. I mean, this is, this is fairy tale stuff. Um, and then you're taking, then you're taking a 700, 700 million chunk out of the block grant. Um, the, the, fourth, the fourth thing is the Treasury's not on board. Uh, I think it has two fears. If it's successful, it sets a dangerous precedent. By the way, it won't be successful. And then if it doesn't work, Northern Ireland becomes a basket pay case and the Treasury has to come back in and bail everyone out. So the Treasury are being deliberately obstructionist. I don't know if anybody's noticed. And I half suspect what's really going on is a political game. The local politicians literally have no idea about the economy. <laughs> Corporation companies. <laughs> they know the Treasury will block it. <coughs> what they're going to say is that they say, we couldn't reach an agreement. We have a plan, but Whitehall blocked it, and it's all their fault. I think that's really what's playing out, but watch this space. Um, 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 and finally, I think there's an alternative. I don't think you have to cut... I don't think you can cut corporation tax and then sit back and watch this magical growth material. So I've tried to, I tried to outline some of the public-private collaborations that there's potential for here, but I think you've got to think outside of the box. Um, but sitting back, cut a corporation tax, waiting for things to happen, it just... Get a strategy first, is my message. Build a cake, then use corporation tax powers as a cherry on the cake. Maybe not going the full 12.5%, full 12.5%. But what's happening, I think, is the politicians are offering up the electorate of a glacé cherry and saying, there's our economic strategy. And I think the people of Northern Ireland deserve better than that. I think, I think what really what's going, I think the sequencing law is all wrong. Well, I mean, what's going on here is kind of playing roulette with public funds and hoping for a win. I mean, if you look at one of the biggest advocates, I'm sorry, am I still being taped? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very nice man at, uh, at Price Waterhouse called Eamon Donaghy. Who's, uh, <laughs> has anybody heard his quote on corporation tax? He oh. said, uh, let's agree this in principle and then we'll sort the numbers out later on. It's supposed to be. Do you think he goes in and audits his, his clients and says, "Let's agree these accounts in principle and we'll agree"? <laughs> now, it wouldn't surprise me if he did. Uh, or do you think he possibly adver uh, uh, advises his corporate clients uh, to, to approach a bank for funding by by saying, "Let's agree this in principle and then we can agree what precise numbers later on"? I mean, it's an it's an absurd proposition, and that that, that shows you how kind of desperate the case for. Or, is that their numbers aren't very good. It's kind of <clears throat> clutching at the straw. But I suspect, the, I suspect, I can't believe, John, John's a politician, so he'll, he'll, he'll know about it. But I can't believe that all among, amongst all of them, there isn't one of them who genuinely know, you know, that there must be those who genuinely know this is a straw man. And I think that playing a political game is the only, it's the only conclusion I can come to that it enables them to say it's all Whitehall's fault. We had a plan, they blocked it. Are there any other questions? Uh, go ahead, Connie. Um, the facts and figures you gave us today were completely mind-boggling and bewildering. But um, yeah, I know it's very po a very populist thing to try and bash the bankers and blame the city for this massive inequality and the massive and the massive risk taking that happened in the financial sector. But do you think there's a way of uh, regulating the financial sector so mad bubbles and mad risk-taking practices are stopped and would there be a legal recourse to uh, like maybe tackling the people who perpetrated these mad risk-taking measures? You, you... Okay, that's a, that's a really good and thoughtful question. I, I mean, I, this is what my research projects are. This is what my proper academic research is. This is, this is, this is me having fun doing a hobby. <laughs> but my real serious stuff is on precisely this point about, about regulation. Um, and my basic point is that you can never remove bubbles in their entirety. They will always occur to an extent. But the only thing you can attempt to do um, is actually restrict the size. Of them. And there is a project underway, an intellectual project underway, and there actually are some serious and quite intellectually radical voices at the Bank of England, which is this great, this great bastion of conservatism. Um, remember I mentioned Andrew Haldane. He's really at the vanguard of it. He's the intellectual driver. It's called macroprudential regulation. Um, it's about injecting greater counter into the financial system. 
introducing counter-cyclical capital buffers so that when hubris starts to take over and bank balance sheets start to grow, they have to put an increasing number of uh, amount of money together uh, aside in a savings account. And that is quite radical because if you think about what neoliberalism has consisted of or what you know the dominant economic ideology, you're almost kind of reversing that by stealth because you're saying, you know, those profits you've just pulled out from all these activities, they're not yours to reinvest back into the market as you see fit. You have to pull that aside and save it for a rainy day because when those asset values drop, you're going to need that money. So there's a way of putting sand into the wheels. Um, I know it sounds like a minimalist solution, but there is a way of doing that. The other question is how much is this is to do with wrongdoing? Now you can go through it and you can find bad apples like Bernie Madoff and all that kind of thing. And you can say, what well, the other thing that you can say is that the ethical standards in some of this were very, 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 very low. I mean, the ethical test for some, whether something was okay in a lot of investment banking activities as a city was, is anybody else doing it? Well, if anybody else is doing it, it's okay. But the instances of criminal wrongdoing, are pro you know, proper, proper, proper criminal wrongdoing, we're talking about, are... Oh, Probably, you know, in a willful fraud, are probably quite small. What's the bigger problem is the kind of hubris and psychology that takes over uh, and leads to, to bubbles, i.e., the idea that, I mean, Minsky said that risk is at its highest precisely when it appears to be at its lowest. And when, it's measured, when risk is measured to low, worry, because that's when it's really high. Um, and I think that you have to have a form of counter-cyclical macro-prudential top-down regulation. I don't think there's a... I, otherwise, I just think that the explosions are going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I also think that some derivatives activity actually is useful on exchange rate risk, on things like farmers' crops. It's not all socially useless, but a lot of it is. And you've got to take a much more selective approach and work out which bits you want and which bits you want to get rid of. The problem is, to build the technical knowledge and ability to do all of that, given the fact regulators were over here, in terms of awareness of what's going on and the sector was over here, and now they're caught up a little bit, but you know, there's still a gap. Um, actually doing that technically takes an awful long period of time. Sorry that was a very long winded answer, but hopefully it gives you some <coughs> sense. Uh, we probably have time for one more question. So, Ryan, uh, <coughs> could you talk about uh, Northern Ireland and how basically to, for mega banks, if we need an economy or with mid level jobs and uh, STEM centres and science centres, as you said, do you all think we need a massive overhaul in ca uh, public capital to facilitate that? Because up until this point, Storm hasn't shown the efficiency or aptitude to possibly uh, execute. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit of this talk that I didn't, that I didn't say, which is, you know, it requires some very bold choices. Um, it requires a lot of innovation, it requires a lot of courage, uh, and it requires really talented people to get involved. And, you know, unfortunately, certainly amongst the politicians and the kind of political establishment in Northern Ireland, that might be lacking. Uh, John and I are trying to are trying to are doing our bit to try and increase levels of economic literacy and build from the bottom up micro strategy. We're we're involved in the Centre for Progressive Economics and I'm involved with the Centre for Economic Empowerment as well, which is linked into the voluntary sector to try and increase the quality of economic debate and build levels of economic literacy. But it's a very yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a survivalist struggle. It's like pushing a boulder up a hill. You know? So yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think the most disappointing thing about this is, 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 is it's not just in Northern Ireland. I mean, you see it in Northern Ireland, but actually, when you look at the national stage, what you see is a generation of politicians that are modelled on Tony Blair. They are what I call washing powder politicians. They specialise in sound bites. They're salesmen. Mm -hmm. They come out with a series of bland, meaningless statements that have no substantive quali quality whatsoever. But they're saying it because a focus group has told them to say it. And they've got advisors whispering in their, in their ears that this is, this is electorally advisable and will be electorally popular. But it has no substance. And this actually, at this moment in time, because of all this stuff, is when we need intellectual politicians <coughs> with big ideas. And I think the population at large is being let down badly by the political classes at the moment. 
not just here in Northern Ireland, across the world. But it may be particularly acute here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, one thing I omitted from my intro was that uh, Dr. Baker is the lead and chief editor of the British Journal of Politics and International Relations, which he wanted to emphasize, so I didn't want to forget it the second time. But um, yeah, just uh, can I get a round of applause for Dr. Baker? Thanks for coming. I don't often, this has been a real treat for me, I don't get often to kind of get the opportunity to speak about this kind of big picture stuff to a captive audience and talk kind of outside of the box, outside of the usual narrow academic constraints. So it's been a pleasure and I've really enjoyed myself. So thank you for coming. Uh, if you just want to take a tea or coffee for the road, go ahead. Yeah. There is a little, is there? And, uh, what